Today on This Week Health. What happens today when your institution does get hit in the cloud? Does the cloud vendor say, oh, here, you can continue giving your users access to the environment with limited functionality? Or does a cloud provider shut down the access until you've mitigated the ransomware attack or the security breach? Welcome to Newsday, a This Week Health newsroom show. My name is Bill Russell. I'm a former CIO for a 16 hospital system and creator of This Week Health, a set of channels dedicated to keeping health IT staff current and engaged. For five years, we've been making podcasts that amplify great thinking to propel healthcare forward. Special thanks to our Newsday show partners, and we have a lot of them this year, which I am really excited about. Cedar sinai Accelerator, ClearSense, CrowdStrike, Digital Scientists, Optimum Healthcare IT, Pure Storage, SureTest, TauSight, Lumion, and VMware. We appreciate them investing in our mission to develop the next generation of health leaders. Now, on to the show. All right, it's Newsday, and we're going to do something a little different. We have two people joining us from Pure Storage. We have Mark Dobbs, who is the Enterprise Imaging Global Director, Eric Nystrom, uh, Enterprise Imaging Principal. A uh, lot of imaging going on over there. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Good morning, Bill. Thanks. You guys seem to like nature backgrounds. Is that a company standard, or are you guys actually in the... In it the, is, uh... yeah. No, Eric and I have made it a mission to travel, right? So we go to all the shows internationally, and so some of those backdrops are when we fly in early on a weekend and we get a chance to do a little hiking. But uh, Eric, where's yours from? Oh, it's just in somewhere in Scandinavia with those wonderful red houses and grass on the roofs. So I, Seriously, it looks like a scene from The Hobbit. I mean... <laughs> Yeah. You got the grass roofs and the, it's pretty amazing. Uh, as people know, the Hobbit was filmed in New Zealand and the landscapes are just unbelievable in, in New Zealand. Uh, Kiwis, as they say, right? The Kiwis. Yeah. Well, talk to me about enterprise imaging a little bit. We had a an AI webinar yesterday and Lee Milligan joined us and he is formerly CIO for Simon Med. And he was talking okay. about how prevalent AI is becoming in imaging. I mean, it, it's been growing over the years, he said, but it's essentially everywhere. He, he identified a couple, I think, hundred companies that are working on imaging in very specific spaces because you have to get FDA approval and it's by disease code and that kind of stuff. So it's very, you can't just say, hey, we're doing all of chests. You have to do chests for pneumonia and then right. get approved and that kind of stuff. I mean, what are you seeing in the space? What are you seeing in the, especially with regard to AI and the imaging space? Yeah, I'll go first, Eric, if you want to layer in. It's interesting. The market blew up, right? So AI and, and imaging is probably one of the areas that took the most interest, I would say, out of the gate in healthcare. And I think it's because obviously GPUs can be used. So NVIDIA was really focusing on the AI market space. And so people really needed help. There's a lot of reasons why AI is seen now, thankfully, not as a threat, but an aid. So some people call AI additional information out there. So a new coining of it, right? Sounds less scary than artificial intelligence. And Radiology has really been hurting for trying to find, well, tool sets to keep up with the surge, right? People are living longer. So we now have longer histories to read through as a physician. And you're having larger data sets, just like our TVs went from 720p up to now 4K. So the resolution's increasing. And you still have the same number of hours in the day to read. So I think AI is now actually coming in to be seen more as an aid. And enterprise imaging is just one of those areas where there's a definite need for that, I think, in healthcare. What do you think, Eric? I mean, the data sets are so large and with so much data being generated, I truly believe that AI will not only help the diagnosis aspect of it, but it will also utilize when taking the load off of the clinicians and the physicians. So. Yeah, he, he noted that at, at his previous employer, there were times where the queue had uh, tens of thousands of images waiting to be read. And he, he said, that's daunting. But if you can have that first read done by AI, you can just escalate the ones that right. require a, additional looks. We have one, two, three, four, five, five stories. Let's see what we can get through. Again, we're hitting all the stories you can find on our thisweekhealth.com slash news site. Regardless of who they're from, this the first one's from The Guardian and the Blackstone CEO, Steve Schwartzman, accuses remote workers of lesser productivity and is saying that they don't work as hard. That's a direct quote, by the way. Remote workers right. do not work as hard. 
And I, I love the headline is remote workers don't work as hard says head of the world's biggest commercial landlord. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like come back into my buildings. I need more money. Yeah, um, exactly. Uh, well, I mean, a lot of irony there. I actually take that as an insult in a way. I mean, I've been working from home for twenty years now, and the biggest complaint from my family is that I work too much. The problem is essentially <laughs> stepping away from the desk or stepping away from just taking that quick call or doing that quick email that I have to get out because my workstation and my office is right there at home. So I would highly disagree with that. Now, I'm sure there are, we hear the water cooler talk and it's better when you're in the office together. And for some lines of business, maybe that is so, but where I sit in this world of enterprise imaging, and I've worked in support implementations, architecture of systems. So I, I find that interesting, but I agree. I mean, if he has a bunch of real estate, that would make sense, right? If, if I had a bunch of real estate, I'd be doing these articles all over the place. Let, let me give you the handful of use cases where, by, by the way, I think we're working through these things. We've had people turn up working for multiple organizations. Like they literally were full-time employees. This happened with Epic analysts. They, they were like, Hey, I could probably handle working for XYZ health system and, and right. this health system and get paid twice the amount of money. So that guy caught pre predominantly because Epic can see it, right? So Epic has right. visibility into what's going on. But regardless, I think some of the areas where it sort of falters is onboarding. Onboarding takes a lot longer. We're currently onboarding a, a new staff member to our organization. And if she was sitting outside my office, we'd have conversations, likely go a lot better. I will say that there's personalities and I, I've talked to some of these people. They're like, I'm like, why are you going into the office? They're like, I have to go into the office. There's too much chaos in my home. I have to, I just can't do it. And then there's other personalities, quite frankly, that need somebody to look after them. Like if you just leave them in their home, they're going to struggle. Now we're disciplined. We've been doing this for many years, but you have to admit there's people that if you gave them sort of the run of the place, they would. They'll go shopping in the middle of the day. They'll, That's right. they'll binge watching Netflix just on the couch, waiting for a call, right? To do action, to do work. We're figuring out what this looks like. Yeah, exactly. I think that's exactly where it's at right now. It's like COVID put a spotlight on it. There's this mixed reaction. Some people are whiplash, like everybody come back. In fact, some of the stats in the article are saying a lot of different organizations by 2026 are saying, let's get back to full time. And I swear, Bill, I don't know if you see this, but it's like a lot of the, at least from the tech space, Silicon Valley, they must all get together and they're like, man, we got to get our employees back in office. It's funny. You see like when Apple says something, right? Then Google says it and they all follow suit. Isn't they it? are. Isn't like, that amazing? Right. So Silicon Valley, the banks, JP Morgan yeah. and others are saying, Hey, let's get back in the office. Amazon recently. I mean, their That's distribution so and stuff has said, hey, three days a week, no excuses, get back yep. in the office. Yep. And I think maybe that'll be another rebound. Maybe in a year from now, when we're talking with you, there'll be a new article that says we're forcing people to take two days at home. Like, who knows where it's going to land? But you're right. There are people, like, think about when you're working out, right? Some people have to be in, in the gym with people, motivating themselves, challenging themselves against other people, right? So that's that in-person spirit that you can't get. But there's others that are fully self motivated right or self-disciplined is probably really the, like with that work ethic you talked about but anyhow it's just we keep seeing these articles and it's just quite comical how it's like 100 percent or zero percent it's like there's little in between and as they're slowly marching to more days back really it's to get back to 100 percent. and i don't know if the body of employees in in mass would agree with that i also believe there's a lot of new companies that have been started since covid or after covid I have a friend of mine that's the CEO for a company where they have no office space whatsoever. They're all remote right. employees and they use remote chair office spaces when they get together and meet. Yeah. And I think that it comes back to what Mark said. If you structure it properly from the beginning and set the expectations, two days, three days, or one day that we meet together as a team, then I think it's okay. But of course, there are horror stories also, right? Yep. Hey, perfect word, by the way, expectations. That's the key, right? So if you're hiring somebody, you set the right expectations. Hey, we're three days a week. I don't think anybody's going to complain. They're going to say three days a week. Fine. As long as I have to get those two days, it's what we're doing to existing employees. I think that's creating this backlash. It's like, Hey, you're in the office every day. Pandemic hits. Hey, you're home all the time. 
hey, now we want you to come back. Hey, we're now defining a new policy that looks like, right. and they're like, well, just pause. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Can we breathe? And I think there's going to lead to some turnover, but let's take a look at the next story because I think this one's interesting too. <laughs> well, there's C our turnover. Exactly. C <laughs> CEOs are leaving their job in record numbers in what the executive suite version of the great resignation. I've, I've seen this talked about in a lot of different ways. One was hey, they helped to get through the pandemic and a lot of them stayed on a little longer than they were going to to help their companies get through the pandemic. And now they're just experiencing burnout and... Yeah other things, it's uh, it's a hard job. Well, we always knew it was a hard job, but evidently it's leading to people uh, leaving at this point. Does this surprise you? Or are you, no, are you it's seeing just, this? It's just a little tongue in cheek, right? The two contradictions of those articles, it's like, yeah, everybody get back to work, but they're like, we're burning out, we're out of here. Like we're done with this place, you know? So not necessarily in that manner. I mean that, you know, with, with levity, but yeah, and it's saying that the tech industry and particularly, I think it mentioned that the government side of things was those types of roles. So CEOs in, in, in government and uh, the tech space were of the higher turnover here. There wasn't, it said there wasn't reasons given for some of the other industries, but yeah, burnout was mentioned, right? And so unfortunately, burnout can come from many ways, many different things. What my just two cents is, as you said, Bill, like expectations and then figuring out how to work now, say post pandemic, I think it's going to be the balancing effect. Companies probably helping find ways to figure out what those like what you as an individual employee value for balance of work life, and can you be remote or do you need to be an employee that identified as someone that's better suited in in person? And the same thing, maybe the CEOs are just not able to control that or see that or don't want to make that commitment to ride this out, right? To see that through because it's it is turbulent. Well, I mean. Also to that point, I mean, it could you could say out with the old and in with the new, and maybe the newer CEOs coming in are more open to remote work versus the older ones. Because if you look at the articles, the comments of we need to get back into the office or we need to take, bring them back to the water cooler is primarily coming from the older CEOs out there in the field. Yeah. I, by the way, I think this is going to continue because we are, first of all, the pandemic was the start, eh, maybe a little before it, of an economic slowdown. And so being a CEO in an economic slowdown is challenging to begin okay. with. And then I, I was talking to a startup CEO recently, and he was sort of pining for the days when he could be a snow bum and just go skiing because he's like, every day, it seems like I'm just raising money. It's like, just keep yeah. raising money. That's the job now. And it's not in fairness to them. It's not what they signed up for, but it's, it's the world that they've inherited. And then the other thing is we have a transformation that's going on with AI right now. I think that is going to wipe out right. a, a series of CEOs that just aren't, they don't grasp it and they don't understand how much it's going to transform their business. And as it's transforming their business, I think a bunch of them are just going to throw up their hands and go, oh my gosh, this is, this is insane. I, yeah. That's a good point, actually. Eric mentioned something that stuck with me. Early when I got into the medical imaging world, I remember that a lot of the people that I was training at the time were basically almost afraid, Bill, to touch the computer and mess things up, right? Because when they started getting used to technology, and I think this is playing a factor mentally, right? Just so, so if, I, if you guys follow me through. So I would have to train people and they go, listen, we're afraid. Being a little bit older, we were doing the computers and putting in the, putting in the paper and the punch cards and things like that to basically get an output. But if we did it wrong, it would break. Like we physically would break the device. He's like, so we're afraid of breaking software now. We don't know. We don't almost trust it. It's like this. It's a one-way portal, right? I give it input. It comes back. And I think that mentality of like technology is something that still is hard to put your hands around. And you go from a mentality of learning how to use a computer for the first time to now like trying to figure out how to wrap around AI and chat GPT as it invades even your employees being leveraging those tool sets. It's, it's probably hard, right? How do you trust that you're getting the output that you're paying your employees for at the end of the day, right? The performance and the expectations kind of line back up. So yeah, I think Eric's got some point to that, but age doesn't necessarily mean we're not saying that like older people generally can't adopt, right? That's not the case. It's just that maybe the mentality, the general consensus is how you came well, I'm, up. I'm, I'm, I'm getting older and, and there's some things I'm struggling to adapt to, but Eric, I want to come to you on this next story, cloud security and health IT challenges, opportunities, considerations. And I, I may not go into the story as much as recent conversations I've been having with CIOs. They are concerned about the rising costs of contracts. And so 
every vendor out there has gone to a subscription model for software and other things and whatnot. And cloud is, is no different. There's a, everything you do in the cloud is essentially per user per month, per whatever per month. And I'm wondering, obviously we're seeing workloads move out to the cloud. I'm wondering if we're going to see workloads come back because of that licensing model, or if the, if the licensing model is following suit in the physical data center as well. I, I mean, even when it comes to security, I have problem with it and I strongly believe what you are saying we are seeing a migration back on prem for those reasons for rising costs costs that you can't really control also environments where you can't really manage the environment as your own right so when you go up in these clouds just because you're going into the cloud that doesn't necessarily mean that you have the same cybersecurity protection that you had with your on-prem environment and the question that we talk a lot about actually, Mark and I is, and we haven't seen it yet, but what happens the day when your institution does get hit in the cloud? Does the cloud vendor say, oh, here, you can continue giving your users access to the environment with limited functionality? Or does the cloud provider shut down the access until you've mitigated the ransomware attack or the security breach? So I honestly believe that we're gonna see for certain workloads and costs, specifically imaging, right? Because the imaging sizes are just growing and growing. And Mark and I, we just came back from a digital pathology trade show and we're looking at data sets there and they're running into the multi gigabytes, right? And now we're talking massive egress fees and ingress fees. So yeah, I remember going from megabytes uh, to gigabytes and I thought, oh my gosh, that's massive amounts. And then you know, then gigabytes to terabytes, I'm like, oh, my, terabytes, what are we talking about here? Now we're terabytes yeah. to petabytes. What's after petabytes? Is it exabytes? Yeah. Are, exabytes. We're not seeing that yet, are we? Yeah, uh, yeah. well, the outside of healthcare, probably, there's probably not an individual healthcare institution or IDN, perhaps, that has, there may be, for all we know, but I don't think we're quite there yet. A thousand petabytes is quite a lot of data. Yeah. Uh, but in mass, though, healthcare, though, Bill, like, so imaging, we're probably generating close to an exabyte a year nowadays, honestly, in imaging. So there was a stat that we had, we referenced in some of our material, where it was in, I think, 2005 or 2008, where we were generating, on estimate, 440 petabytes a year. And that was in 2008. So right. we've got to be scratching the exabyte a year just in imaging alone, globally. And now we've got digital pathology, like Eric said, coming up. We've got cryo EM. We've got these huge data sets that... It's almost like you have to question almost like, can we sustain this? And if we can, is the cost worth it? If you go, you got to really think again about IT and where you're going to put your data, probably more so than you thought you would, right? I think people are looking for cloud as the savior to remove all those obstacles. But I think that you got to put a little bit more scrutiny and calculus on just how you're going to use that data to, to determine where you're going to place it. I mean, especially with imaging, I mean, it's basic math, right? Bandwidth, latency, <laughs> packet size, right? And yeah. that will never go away. And and the connection to the cloud is not necessarily the same connection that you have to your local data center. Not yet. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, I can't even imagine. But do you guys see the story where the CISO for Solar Winds has been named in the SEC investigation, essentially, as culpable because he was hiding facts about their security posture? Oh, um, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting one as well. And a cautionary tale, if you will, to avoid. If you're a CISO and you see things, my gosh, put it on a slide deck, put it in emails, get it out. Somewhere, right? right? Document it. Yeah, you, you don't want to be standing out on an island when, when something finally goes south. We have the story of a, a bridge raised $30 million. There's a belief that it is very difficult to raise money right now, but I'm seeing companies raise money. So there is money to be invested and they are looking for companies that have a strong value proposition, a path to profitability that is right. near, near term, far term. They're not looking at growth at all costs. They're looking at well-run, well-managed organizations with a pipeline of sales that are actually closing sales today. I'm curious, you guys read this story. I mean, what are your takeaways from this fundraise? I find it 
interesting, right? Because, and I, I found that article very interesting in the sense that they created the product for the patients first, right? It was created as an app where patients could walk into a doctor's visit and it would record the whole conversation and then translate the words that the patient didn't really understand, which was more doctor lingo, right? And now they've taken this application and they've given it to the physicians to record their doctor notes and speed up their time that they're spending with the patient and creating the notes. I think that companies like this, we will see continue receiving funding because like you said, they have a specific outcome and they have a product and they have a solution for a problem, right? For products where, you know, like we saw early on, even early on in the dot-com, pizzaboy.com was funded millions and millions of dollars. And of course, it just went away because it was not something that was a need for, right? But here we have a need. So I strongly believe that the AIs and the technology where we see an outcome and where we solve a problem, funding will continue. This one's interesting to me because this space is getting commoditized. There are open source models out there today that you could do dictation at a pretty high rate of accuracy. And there are also obviously ChatGPT and others. There's also models out there that can take that dictation and summarize it really well, summarize it to the point where it can become a perfect soap note. And I've seen these startups because I, I, I get called in to take a look at them and I bring clinicians in and they go, yeah, that's a great soap note. And, but the reality is I was talking to CIOs, they're like, man, these companies are popping up all over the place and they're excited about it because this used to be a technology that was cost prohibitive. They used to have to select just a handful of doctors or this percentage of doctors. And their hope is that because this technology is proliferating and being commoditized, that they're going to be able to give it to all the doctors because it's in their estimation, huge satisfier. People are very excited about the technology and what it can do, not only on the clinician side, but also on the patient side, because we've used ChatGPT and you just say, hey, put this in a level that a patient would understand, right. someone who didn't graduate from medical school would understand, and it can write the summary for the patient in that language. And, yeah, in a more layman speak. Yeah, and that's and what I liked about this one too, because the net result of this, like you said, Bill, this technology leads to the physicians being able to engage and face the patient. Like the three of us are looking at each other on the Zoom screen. This type of technology brings the doctor back to observing the patient. And so I think that there's that that art was lost when we went EMR meaningful use days. I'm sure you were there, Bill, for meaningful use. Probably the best uh, time of your life there, right? Wow, that hurts. Stop bringing that so, up. So th- I like this. And, and I think that as this evolves, maybe this is a weird way of saying this, right? AI brings more of a human effect back in, into the treatment of healthcare. And then it normalizes it like Eric was saying and you were saying. So the patients will understand the output. Maybe that encourages this reciprocity effect, right? For patients to continue to find medical treatment. Well, to that point, the other article that you had from Nature, which talked about researchers using ChatGPT for translation for emails and communication. And I can actually relate to this. I'm naturally born in Sweden, but I didn't continue my education in Sweden. So for me to write business type letters in Swedish on an English keyboard, is interesting. So it's actually fantastic for translating from English to French or English to Swedish or English to other languages. And just like that article spoke in, about in the Nature article, here we see this is happening with clinicians and doctors in Japan speaking to clinicians and doctors in the United States, for example, where they can speak in their native tongue and then have it translated. Yep, absolutely. Gentlemen, this was fun. Man, having more people talk about the news is a lot of fun. So I, I really appreciate you coming in. I uh, appreciate the work that you're doing over at Pure. And uh, yeah, look forward to catching up with you guys again. Likewise. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Eric. Absolutely. Thank you. And that is the news. If I were a CIO today, I think what I would do is I'd have every team member listening to a show just like this one and trying to have conversations with them after the show about what they've learned and what we can apply to our health system. If you want to support This Week Health, one of the ways you can do that is you can recommend our channels to a peer or to one of your staff members. We have two channels, This Week Health Newsroom and This Week Health Conference. You can check them out anywhere you listen to podcasts, which is 
a lot of places, Apple, Google, Overcast, Spotify, you name it, you can find it there. You can also find us on YouTube. And of course, you can go to our website, thisweekhealth.com. And we want to thank our Newsday partners, again, a lot of them, and we appreciate their participation in this show. Cedar sinai Accelerator, ClearSense, CrowdStrike, Digital Scientists, Optimum, Pure Storage, SureTest, TauSite, Lumion, and VMware, who have invested in our mission to develop the next generation of health leaders. Thanks for listening. That's all for now. <laughs>